Welcome to this online worship celebration of St. Andrews by the Sea in San Clemente, California. I'm Pastor Eric Smith. I'm so glad that you can be part of the worshiping community here right now. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome to online worship at St. Andrews. My name is Emily Bredhauer and I'm the Director of Programs. It's August now and the start of school has been on my mind. In our household of four kids from kindergarten to high school, we are preparing as best we can. But we're not quite certain what it will look like as we head into distance learning. But there are still some recommended school supplies, so we dutifully got those and the kids are gradually, maybe grudgingly, getting ready for school, whatever it might look like this year. One of the things that got skipped this summer was the now annual backpack and school supply drive for family assistance ministries that we do in conjunction with Vacation Bible School. Even though we didn't have VBS this year, we can still have the school supplies drive. Kids will still be going to school and children will still need pencils and pens and paper, even at home. So here's the quick list of things to add to your next Amazon order or maybe your next Target or Walmart run. New backpacks, lined paper, graph paper, markers, number two pencils, pens, erasers, scissors, pencil boxes to keep all those writing implements in, glue sticks, three ring binders, really anything a child in kindergarten all the way through high school might need. Please donate new supplies if at all possible. Put all of those supplies into a bag or a backpack and then swing on by the church on Saturday, August 15th. I'll be there to collect your donations with my mask on from 10 until noon. You should wear a mask as well. Your continued financial support of the mission and the ministries of St. Andrews is inspirational. This community of faith is remarkable and your support is appreciated. Thank you. Remember 
Pray with me. O Lord our God, we are your children who love you and are here in this moment to worship. We give you thanks for the gift of life. We are your grateful people. We give you thanks for our young families and we lift them up in prayer. What a challenging time to be a young parent. We pray for them as they assimilate information and sort it out to make the decisions they must make for the safety of their children and their education. We pray for young families, for their health, for their homes, and for the teaching and the learning that soon begins. We pray for teachers and administrators who are acquiring new skills and will soon have computer classrooms full of students. We offer our prayer today for families who have lost loved ones in the virus. We pray for those who are ill now. We pray for healthcare workers whose jobs are dangerous and so necessary for us all. May they find courage, strength, and blessing from you in the work that they do. We have personal prayers of joy and concern. In these next moments of silence, we lift them to you. May we, who have gathered in your spirit, live in your peace, live each day in hope, and practice compassion for others. This is our prayer. Let us continue to pray as Jesus taught, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Good morning. Our scripture reading today is from the book of 2 Kings. The theme of the passage is in keeping with our sermon series, Sing the Songs of Zion. The reading is the biblical description of the events and the people who were taken to captivity to become exiles in Babylon. Listen to the narrative. This is 2 Kings chapter 24, verses 10 through 16. At that time, the servants of King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came up to Jerusalem, and the city was besieged. King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came to the city while his servants were besieging it. King Jehoiachin of Judah gave himself up to the king of Babylon, himself, his mother, his servants, his officers, and his palace officials. The king of Babylon took him prisoner in the eighth year of his reign. He carried off all the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house. He cut in pieces all the vessels of gold in the temple of the Lord, which King Solomon of Israel had made. All this, as the Lord had foretold. He carried away all Jerusalem, all the officials, all the warriors, 10,000 captives, all the artisans and the smiths. No one remained except the poorest people of the land. He carried away Jehoiachin to Babylon, the king's mother, the king's wives, his officials, and the elite of the land he took into captivity from Jerusalem to Babylon. The king of Babylon brought captive to Babylon all the men of valor, 7,000, the artisans and the smiths, 1,000, all of them strong and fit for war. Today we're into the second part of a three-part series called Sing the Songs of Zion. Let's start with a bit of review. Kings David and Solomon reigned over what was called the United Monarchy of Israel and Judah for most of the 10th century BC. Israel and Judah then became separate kingdoms. Israel, the Northern Kingdom, Judah, the Southern Kingdom. Little Israel and little Judah got marched through several times in their history. My seminary professor talked about the reality that Israel and Judah were located right where the empires shifted. They were in the midst of power flows. When the empire of Egypt expanded off the African continent, they marched right through a flow of power. When the Assyrians marched into Africa, their power flowed right through Israel and Judah. When the Babylonians expanded their empire, the power flowed again. Centuries later, Greek power flowed through the land and then Roman. Every time the power flowed through that coastal land bridge between Africa and Asia, the people called Israel and their lands were subject to the direction, the desires, the cultures, and the will of the dominating empires. In 722 BC, the northern kingdom of Israel was overrun by the Assyrian Empire and ceased to exist. That left only the southern kingdom of Judah. In the year 586 BC, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon conquered Judah. His armies destroyed Solomon's temple and made Jerusalem a wasteland. Many citizens of Judah were taken 700 miles away to captivity in Babylon. One author described what took place in this way. He, he wrote, 
Empire in the ancient world was less about conquering territory to rule it so much as it was about defeating armies to force them to pay heavy tributes every year. And if there's one thing people hated, it was paying tribute. Many rebellions occurred. Many alliances rose and fell. At some point, the Babylonians got sick and tired of Jerusalem being a rebellious pain, so they sacked the city and took away its aristocracy to live in Babylon. The Babylonians took Judah's leading citizens, the king and his court, people with education and the military. They had seen their homeland destroyed, the temple, the city, all the important buildings gone. Biblical historians interpreted what had happened theologically. That is, they saw how God was at work in this. Yahweh had used Nebuchadnezzar to judge the people called Israel because of their sin in not being faithful to God. Once in Babylon, the exiles had difficulties that were emotional and spiritual, but their lives were not in danger. They were not persecuted in Babylon. They were settled into some good real estate mentioned in Psalm 137 as by the waters of Babylon. Why were they treated so well? And with so much freedom, why didn't they leave? Babylon was not a bad place. It was cosmopolitan in the ancient world. The exiles were imported immigrants brought in because the economy needed their skills to create business. Babylon needed them. There was nothing to go home to. Their homeland had been effectively destroyed. Their community of loved ones and colleagues were all in Babylon, so there was no one waiting for them in Judah. And life in Babylon was good. There was no reason to leave. They were allowed to meet freely, to buy land and establish businesses. Before it all happened, Jeremiah had warned that the homeland would be lost. No one believed him then. He had a pretty miserable time of it, ridiculed and tormented. Later, he prophesied future hope, a day when God would restore them to the homeland. But that was a promise for the future, and the longer they stayed in Babylon, the desire to return to Zion began to ebb. Central to their self-understanding was worship. Worshiping God was a physical act that had to take place where God was. How could they worship God in Babylon? God was not in Babylon. Slowly, the way they thought of God changed. The exiles had understood Yahweh to be their God, the God of Israel. Yahweh lived on Mount Zion and dwelt in the promised land. While other nations had their own gods, the Israelites knew that their God, Yahweh, was chief among all the gods. Jeremiah had spoken Yahweh's word in prophesying the destruction of the homeland and the exile. Jeremiah said that the exiles would be back someday, and then he bought a piece of land near Jerusalem to make the point. The prophet Ezekiel, who was a contemporary of Jeremiah's, left Judah and was an exile in Babylon. He became the central figure in the changing way the exiles thought about God. His contribution transformed their theology. God's presence was perceived as more radically separate. It wasn't just about geography anymore. It was a new sense of spirituality. Ezekiel described the promised land in a way that had nothing to do with physical geography and the homeland. He created a spiritual reality 
that had not formerly been part of Jewish thinking. God was transcendent. In the centuries that followed, the biblical author's presentation and interpretation of Babylon changed. While it was always a geographic place, it became a metaphor for several things. Babylon represented living out of sync with God. It was both separation from God and a bad place to be. The exiles had come from a homogenous culture where religious diversity was not practiced and barely even tolerated. Although the city of Babylon was not any worse than any big city of the ancient world, it held a plethora of religious possibilities with various temples and cults, shrines, and gods. For the exiles, this was paganism, anathema to their monotheistic faith in Yahweh. So what have we said? When the Jews went to Babylon, they were exiled from Judah and from God. Their prophet in Babylon, Ezekiel, had a new vision of how God was not limited to a physical place and new spirituality emerged. The metaphor of Babylon evolved even more. 600 years later, the name appears in the New Testament in the book of Revelation, and the reference isn't positive. Rome was the new Babylon then, and John described her from a vision. So he carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was full of blasphemous names, and it had seven heads and ten horns. The woman was clothed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and jewels and pearls, holding in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the impurities of her fornication. And on her forehead was written a name, a mystery, Babylon the Great, mother of whores and of earth's abominations. And I saw that the woman was drunk with the blood of the saints and the blood of the witnesses to Jesus. When I saw her, I was greatly amazed. Since the days of Rome, there have been other empires, the Mongol, the British, the Russian, a couple of caliphates, the French, the Spanish, the Portuguese. Some include America in that list. At one time or another, all of them were pointed out as the new Babylon. The telling attribute of the Babylon metaphor is that in character and in culture, Babylon crosses purposes with God. It does not recognize the supremacy of the one God. Empires, at their worst, devalue human life in favor of the rich, the powerful, expanding national influence, and growing their economy. The worst aspect of the Babylon concept is that people become expendable and then expended for the purposes of the empire. The opposite of this metaphor of evil in empire is the promised land of God, the land that God promised Abraham when he believed God. Now it's no longer a physical place, just as the biblical metaphor of Babylon is not a physical place. The promised land, as it evolved in concept, is what Jesus named the kingdom of God. That's the promised land. It's the idea of people living together with compassion and equity, where all have enough, where God's peace pervades every aspect of existence, where war is no more and the whole creation prospers. That is the promised land. This is the ideal and the vision of people of faith. Babylon is temporal. The kingdom of God 
is eternal. The kingdom of God is our hope and our true home. That's our time of worship together for today. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen.